Uh, I'm excited about this message because this is the greatest story ever told. Uh, and I, I say story lightly. Uh, I, if you know me, uh, if you've been around me very long, you know that I'm, I'm kind of rigid about I don't like to call the things in the Bible stories because they're real. But uh, sometimes you can tell a story about something that was real. Sometimes I tell you a story about this is something that happened in my life. Uh, so don't get hung up on that. This story is powerful. Uh, it is beautiful. Uh, and I want to tell you that this story is necessary. For a life of hope. It's necessary for a life of faith. This is a story that is powerful by itself. It actually doesn't really even need to be built up. It doesn't really need to be uh, done in a, a super creative way because the power is in the story itself. Um, but as I was preparing for this mentally, uh, sometimes for weeks I'm, I'm kind of preparing mentally kind of where I'm going to go with something and what I feel like the Lord's been showing me. But uh, as we've been, we've watched a lot more TV than we normally do. Um, we don't have cable. We use Hulu and we're watching America's Got Talent. It's a pretty cool show. Uh, it's, it's neat to see the things that people can do. Uh, and uh, as we watch that show, if, if you don't know, people have crazy skills, crazy talents. Uh, but, but what I really liked was that they would kind of start to show you, as people progress on the show, they would begin to show you their story. They'd begin to show you where the people came from, what the people have gone through. Um, and, I, and as we got to the end, I was actually kind of surprised uh, at some of the people that made it through. Uh, I thought, well, they didn't seem really as talented as some people who've already been eliminated. Uh, and, and I was thinking about that, and, and, and it's kind of weird uh, that one morning I was in the shower, okay, so I watched it the night before, uh, and I'm in the shower, and I really felt like God showed me this. So if you'd say TV's from the devil, listen, God can show you things through TV shows. We did a, a war against cancer several years ago, probably about five years ago, and that was birthed out of watching the show Parenthood, that when the woman on there got cancer, like, it really hit me hard in the heart, and I felt like God kind of revealed some things to me, and we did a war on cancer, so I'm just telling you, God sometimes works through things that, like a TV show that you wouldn't expect, but what he showed me was, was this, that, that uh, there's people that have great talent, uh, but what people remember the most is really the story. What people really clung to was the story, the story of what they've been through, what they've overcome. That's what stuck with the people. And the people that were in the top, like, five were the people that the show, at least, gave us the most dramatic story. Okay, and so the show, it's a production, so it puts on the story and builds up different stories. But, but the, the ones that they invested the most into and revealed the most about their story ended up being the five that were in the finals that were voted on by the fans. It's because they bought into the story. They were drawn into the story. They were moved by the story. And so this morning, on Easter morning, what are we moved by? Uh, are we moved by just the fact that Jesus had amazing talents, so to speak, if you want to call him that, right? He, he performed great miracles. He did great Things that were probably amazing to see, but what about his story? What about the things that he had to go through? What about the things that he had to overcome? Right? We know what happened on Friday. We just remembered that in a time of communion, but we know that Jesus was beaten. We know that guards slapped him in the face and spit in his face, they ripped out his beard. We know they mocked him. We know they put a crown of thorns on his head. We know that they made him carry his cross. We know that he was nailed to a cross. We know that he suffered, that he died. We know that he bore the sin of the world upon his shoulders. We know that he gave his life for you, for me. Then we know that they took him off of that cross. Hallelujah. Praise God that he's not on 
the cross anymore. They laid him in a tomb carved out of the rock, and in front of this tomb they rolled a large stone in front of the door, in front of the opening. It was sealed, and there were guards placed outside to prevent anyone from stealing his body. They were so worried about someone stealing Jesus to pretend that he was risen. They went through all these precautions. Stone rolled against the door, sealed, guards outside. Matthew 28, verse 1, tells us the story of this Sunday morning. It says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he will be going before you into Galilee, and you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to bring word to his disciples. And when they told the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and they will see me there. This work on the cross uh, made redemption complete. Right? This is where we could be forgiven. This is where we were given access to the throne room of God. But the resurrection, church, the resurrection is where the work was Verified, where the work was validated. Have you ever been in that spot where you're trying to explain something to someone uh, that's kind of unbelievable, right? It's, it's, it's so unbelievable that they're like, that cannot be true. Like that, that is, that's, un, that's, I'm very skeptical that, that actually happened. I don't know about you guys, but I've been on that side way more times than I can count where I'm like, I don't think so, man. Let's, let's see some proof. Let's see some evidence. I, I want to know, how am I going to know that what you're telling me is true? Prove it. Think about this. Jesus lived a sinless life. He died for our sins. He took our place. He paid our ransom. He made a way for us to come back to the Father. And it almost seems unbelievable. Right? To many of you listening, it's very believable because you've re received and experienced the power of it. But if you put yourself on the, the outside, if you put yourself back to that place in your life where you probably heard it and you weren't really ready to hear it, and you didn't believe it, and you thought, there's no way. What's the proof? What's the evidence? The resurrection is the evidence. The resurrection is the proof because the resurrection shows the Father's approval of the work that was done at the cross. John 3.16, our favorite verse in the world. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We love that verse. It's a great verse. Even people who aren't Christians speak that verse. I'm not sure why. Uh, if there's no power in it for them, but, but they do. But look at verse 17. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It was God's plan all along to save us. God so loved the world that he sent his Son. Do you ever think about Jesus' part, right? Jesus so loved the world that he died to save it. I mean, I mean, we focus on the Father and we think the Father sent his Son. That's amazing. What a sacrifice. He really loved the world. 
But Jesus, too, really loved the world to the point that he was obedient to the point of death so that he could save the world. And then we see that God so loved his son that he raised him from the dead to restore the world that he died to save. And if you can hear my voice this morning, you need to know something that Jesus was sent to save you. Right? He came for you. He loves you. He died for you. He rose for you. Take it personally this morning. I want to tell you that it doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter where you have been. It doesn't matter what other people might be saying about you or saying to you. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what the other voices are that you may be hearing. He died so that you can be forgiven, and he rose so that you can be victorious. Amen? This is everything, church. Everything we believe hinges on Jesus' resurrection because the victory is in the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14 to 19 says, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ. Whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile. That means worthless. And you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. They're dead. They're gone. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. I stand here this morning preaching the word of God, preaching the gospel, and I can say with my whole heart that I believe my preaching is not empty. I, I can say with my whole heart... I believe that my faith is not empty. I believe that my preaching is full, and I believe that my faith is full because I believe that my Redeemer lives today. Those who saw the risen Lord, they're not false witnesses because, in fact, God did raise Jesus from the dead. There was an earthquake and a stone rolled away, but Jesus was not there. I don't know if you guys have really ever thought about it, but when they would die, they would wrap them in cloths. I mean, I don't know about you, but today we put people in straitjackets so they their arms don't work and they can't get out. And being wrapped in a cloth tightly like that would be equivalent to probably being in a straitjacket of sorts. The stone was still in front of the door and Jesus was not there. He got out of the cloth wrappings uh, and then he got out of the tomb with the stone still in front of the door. And he defeated the enemy. Hallelujah. And because of the resurrection, because Jesus lives, we, first of all, we have victory over Satan. We have victory over Satan. See, Satan is the ruler of this world. Some of you don't like that. Uh, I don't think any of us necessarily like it. Uh, some of you, maybe that rubs you the wrong way. Some of you, maybe you disagree, but it's biblical. Uh, that Because sin entered through Adam, Adam gave over the dominion to Satan. He gave Satan the power that God had given to him to have dominion over the world. All the world was under the sway of the wicked one. Many still are. That explains the evil we see today. When people have that question of, well, well, why does God allow this and why doesn't God do this? The, the question really is, why is evil happening? Because the enemy is still in dominion over the majority of our world. It explains the evil we see today. But Jesus, Hebrews 2.14, now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, right? He became flesh and dwelt among us so that through his death, he might destroy the one holding the power of death. That is the devil. 
Jesus came not just to destroy death, but to destroy the one who has the power over death. The devil in Christ, we don't have to be subject to Satan's rule and authority anymore. We still live in a fallen world. We still are around sinful people. We still commit sins because of the world we're in and because of our surroundings and because we're not perfect yet. We're not fully in the image of Christ yet. But what I want to tell you is that we don't have to be subject to the devil's rule. He doesn't have authority in our life unless we give it to him as children of God. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He transferred us, right? He took us from a place of darkness, and He put us in the kingdom of His love. And once you get transferred, you don't belong at the old place anymore. Get out, right? If you get transferred, you don't belong there anymore. If a, if a workplace transfers you and you try going back, you try to swipe your badge and get in the door, it doesn't work anymore. You've been transferred. You go somewhere else. You don't belong here anymore. He transferred us. And when you think about being transferred at a job, you pick up and move. You pick up and go from one place. I don't belong here anymore. Now I belong over here into another. And what usually happens in a transfer is everything about your life changes. Right? You're in a new town. You're in it, maybe a familiar type of job, but it's new people, a new layout, a new setup. You have a lot of uh, differences being made in your life. Everything becomes different. And so if you find yourself in darkness, and I want to be clear that darkness for most people does not mean demonic possession. It just means under Satan's influence. If you find yourself in darkness, in the spiritually dark place, if you find yourself in hopelessness and you belong to Jesus Christ, get out. Get out because you've been transferred. You don't belong there anymore. You belong in the kingdom of his love. Your address has been changed, right? Where you report to has been changed. Your boss, your ruler has changed. Report to work, report to duty. Colossians 2, verse 14 and 15 says that he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us. And he's taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. He disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them. Listen, if you've been transferred, if, if you don't belong at your old place anymore, I'll tell you what, if this happened in real life, what you do is you stop answering the boss, the old boss's phone calls. I know I would do. It's like, dude, I don't, I'm not subject to you anymore. I'm not answering your phone calls anymore. Uh, I, you're not my boss anymore. Listen, if you belong to Jesus, I'm going to tell you, you need to stop answering the phone calls when the devil calls. You need to stop answering. You need to say, you know what? You're not my boss anymore. I'm not subject to you. I don't have to do what you say. I have victory over you in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for the resurrection. Because of the resurrection, we also have victory over sin. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. It's worthless. And you're still in your sins. See, we have victory over the devil. And because we have victory over the devil, we have victory over the sin that he birthed in us. 1 John 3, 8, he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. See, he, was, he came so he could destroy the devil, as in Hebrews 2.14 that we just read. But now he also has come to destroy the works of the devil. Have you ever thought about what the works of the devil are? The works. This word in the original Greek 
is, I'll say it wrong, but it's ergon. Ergon, and it means business. It means that with which someone is occupied. Jesus came so he could destroy the devil and put him out of business. He came so he could destroy the devil and all the things he was occupied with to destroy them as well. He destroyed the owner. Now he's going after the business. Many of you know that when the owner falls, usually the business is right behind. It's coming right behind. Satan's occupied with the business of sin. He's occupied with being the great tempter. He's occupied with being a liar and a thief. He tells us things like sin is okay, sin might feel good for a moment, uh, but we got to know that there are consequences to sin, that without Jesus they are irreversible. But with Jesus, they can be wiped clean. Have you ever signed up for something that sounded good? You're like, man, this seems like a really good deal. This seems like it's something that I'm really going to enjoy. Only to later find out that there was a hook in it. Right? Only to later find out that it was all a setup just to get you reeled in. There's, there's, there's things in life that they seem to be good. They seem to be pleasurable until we bite down. Until we get hooked. And then we find ourselves struggling like a fish on a fishing hook. Trying to get itself free. Now I don't know about you, but, but when I've gone fishing... I've had some fish that have jumped off the hook, but not many, right? Not many. And usually if the fish got off the hook, it was my fault, right? It was something I did wrong. It was I was using the wrong thing or I was doing the wrong, or doing the wrong method or I didn't set it or there's something that I did. I didn't grab the net quick enough because I knew it was a big one, right? It's not very often that the fish actually gets off the hook if you're doing things right. Listen, Satan knows how to push your buttons. He knows all the schemes, all the ploys. He's pretty much always doing the right thing to tempt you. It's just, are you willing to take the bait? Are you willing to look at it and see it as something that looks pleasurable and not think about the hook that is set behind it? Because if you do, then you will find yourself struggling to try to get free from it. That's sin. It looks good, but if you bite it, you get hooked. And if you can't free yourself, you need someone to remove it for you. That's what Jesus did. Romans 6, chapter, chapter 6, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead, Offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourself to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under law, but under grace. See, it will not rule over you. You know, the devil's business would die down on its own if he didn't have so many repeat customers. See, we're actually the issue. With, with not overcoming the devil because we continue to go back. We continue to go back to the store and ask for more. Don't let sin reign. Give your life to Jesus. And it will not rule over you. This doesn't mean you won't sin ever in your life. But what it means is that sin will not rule over you. It will not have authority over you. It won't have power over you. You can defeat it. You can overcome it by the power of the Holy Spirit because Jesus already has. Because the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you if you belong to Christ. And the third victory because of the resurrection is the victory over death. The victory over death. 1 Corinthians 15, 18, back to the if, if he had not been risen. It says, that also those who had fallen asleep in Christ have perished. See, we have victory over Satan. We have victory over sin. And we have victory over death. Our final resting place is not six feet under. Is it six or eight? Six. I wrote eight. I don't think that's right. Our, our, our final resting place, we, 
maybe, maybe some places, maybe in some, some counties, right? Uh, but our final resting place is not six feet under. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I hope that you do this morning, church. Do you know that the thing that people fear the most is death? The thing that people fear the most is death. And I'm not just talking about unbelievers. I mean, you would think in the church we wouldn't fear death, but I'm telling you that most people, their greatest fear, if they're being honest, is death. The medical news today reported that no association has been found between religious engagement and reduced death anxiety. From their studies, if you already had death anxiety, no religious engagement was a cure for that. Now, to me, I would say there's a difference between religious engagement and having an encounter with the living God. Okay, that's what I'm saying, but most Christians around the world are sitting in the pews and have not had a true, genuine encounter with God, or they have, but it's been so long ago that they forgot it. Okay? You might have your reasons why you're anxious about death, why you're worried about death, why you're scared about death, but do you know that the Word tells us that this life is as a vapor, right? It's here and gone before you know it. Now, it doesn't seem like that right now. Right now, the last four weeks has seemed like four months. Okay, so it may not seem like it's real quick right now, uh, but that will change. I don't know if you remember high school, but high school was pretty similar to right now. High school, those four years seemed like four lifetimes. <laughs> and so, so these four weeks that we've had that seem like four months really are not that bad. We've been through this before. And as you guys know, once you get out of high school, it speeds up. And it speeds up quick. And the older you get, it's like the faster it gets going. So this life is fast. It goes really quickly compared to eternity. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 is said again, if there's no resurrection, it says that if in this life only, just for here today, we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most Pitiable. Let me tell you some other words for pitiable, or if you want to say pitiful, your translation might say. Here's some other words for that. Miserable. Pathetic. Sorry. Woeful. Insignificant. He's saying that if, if we just have the hope of Christ in this life and not in the life to come, we're insignificant. This life is insignificant. Without eternal life, the life we live right now does not matter a bit. It doesn't matter at all. If, if at the end of this, we're just done. If at the end of this life right here today, we're just done, it's a pretty insignificant life. I don't know about you guys, but there may be people that have accomplished a lot more Things than I have. Uh, I'd say probably everybody, we could find somebody that's done more than what we have done. But I'm going to tell you that this isn't the life that I'm living for. But while I'm living this life, I, I'm, I'm trying to set my gaze on eternity. I'm trying to set my gaze on what are the things that I'm doing today that impact the life that is to come, which is going to be far greater, far longer, far superior. Uh, and I want everybody that I know to be there. People today are afraid of the coronavirus. They are afraid. There is fear embedded in people because it's being driven by our media, first of all. But they're not really afraid of getting flu-like symptoms. right? They're not really afraid. And some people... We're just going to be real. There's some people that normally, when they're not quarantined, would totally take a, a week of the flu just to not have to go to work. There are people that dislike their job that much, or that are that wore out, they could really use a break. 
They're not really afraid of the symptoms. They're not really even afraid of respiratory distress because if they're healthy, they know that most likely it's going to be a little thing that they're going to come out of. Most people, what most people are afraid of is the media has told us about death. The media has told us about the people that could die, the people that will die, which their projections so far have been way off, but it's driven a lot of fear. And I want to tell you that anything that you're afraid of has power over you. But in Jesus, we have victory over death. See, I'm not afraid of death. Am I being cautious? Yes, I am. Am I taking what the medical experts say seriously and trying to abide by it? Yes, I am. You guys don't know how much I miss my church. You guys don't know how much I miss my family. But I'm taking it seriously, not because I fear death, but because I love this life that I'm living. And I love the impact that I'm having for the future life to come. I love what I do. I love preaching the word of God. I love trying to help people get through things, help them to see what God is doing and what God is showing them. But I'm not afraid of death, guys. I'm not. I could go today and I would be fine with that. Jesus said, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Guys, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he is risen. I believe that he is alive today. He is well. He is in a physical body, in a heavenly place, seated on a throne in power and glory, and he's praying for you. He's praying for me. He's interceding for us all the time, the word tells us. And he says that if I believe in him, even if I die, I shall live. Yes. That even in death, I will be alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, death, where is your victory? Right? Death, where is your sting? Like you don't have one. You don't have victory over the child of God, and you don't even have sting over the child of God. You got nothing. There's nothing that you have over me, death. And I tell you what, death has no victory over the child of God, because to live is Christ, to die is gain. Right? Paul told us that. He's like, you know what? To live is Christ. I'm living this life for Jesus, and it's great, and I love it, and God is good, but to die is gain, because I'm going to go and be with him. It's better. Listen, I trust Jesus for my family if I die just as much as I trust him for my family if I live. I just want to squash that fear in your life right now. I've had that fear before where I thought about my family. I thought about my family. If I die, right, it, it uproots my whole family. They don't have a, a dad, a husband, or a pastor anymore. And they've got to find a different job and another place to, to live. But you know what? I believe in God to do good for my family, to take care of my family right here while I'm alive. And I believe that he can do it if I'm gone. The trust in him remains the same. It's not my, If my trust in God is contingent on whether I'm alive or not, that's pretty shaky trust. I know where I'm going. I know that my God who's alive went to prepare a place for me. I know it's going to be a place with no pain. I know it's going to be a place with no tears. I know that it's going to be a place with no more death. Hallelujah. I don't fear death because I have victory over it. I don't fear the devil because I have victory over him. I don't fear sin any longer because I have victory over that sin. See, the devil might be the ruler of this world, but he's not the ruler of my world. See, he might be the ruler of this world, but he's not the ruler of my world because the ruler of my world is Jesus Christ. I was born once, and then I was born again. Listen, I'm an overcomer. You're an overcomer. 
my God and your God rose from the dead so that we could live a life of victory. And 1 John 5 tells us that for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. If you're born of God, you overcome the world. It says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. It's our faith. It's our faith. What were we told in 1 Corinthians? Without the resurrection, our faith is worthless. But with the resurrection, our faith is everything. It's the power to overcome. Do you have faith in Jesus this morning? Some of you think that your life is finished. You think that your life is over. But I want to tell you that on the cross, Jesus said three words. He said, it is finished. And when he said, it is finished, it was the same thing as him saying, and you are not. It is finished. His work is finished. You're not finished. You have a hope in a future in Christ Jesus. Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe in your heart that what we celebrate today is true? That God raised him from the dead and he lives in power and victory today. Today as we close out in worship and in blessing, I just want you to lift your hands in the air. I want you just to cry out and surrender if that's what you need to do. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I'm not going to even tell you the words to say because I believe that you know the words that you need to say. And if you don't know anything else to say at all, just say Jesus. Just say Jesus in the meditation of your heart as it comes through your mouth. He knows what your desire is. He knows what your need is. He knows what you're deficient in. He knows what you need the victory over. And today, as he comes into your life, receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It's in you right now. It's in you right now. I just want you to claim these things after me right now in Jesus' name. Say, I have victory over the devil. I have victory over sin. I have victory over death. Because my God lives. And because my God lives, I too will live. Because my God lives, I too will one day be where he is. Jesus, I love you. I trust you. I give my life to you. There is nothing I need more than you. Lord, today I recognize that I surrender my life to you. I surrender my mind over to you. And I say, Lord, have your way. Let your perfect spirit do its perfect work in perfecting my mind to be in obedience your word. Lord, I love you and I praise you today. We give you glory and praise and honor. We celebrate a God who lives. We have the only God who lives. We have the only God who was and is and is to come. He always has been. He always will be. He's always been for you. He'll always be with you. He'll always be fight on your behalf. Just surrender to him this morning. Lord, we love you. We are going to celebrate. Lord, we're going to claim your promises over our lives right now. We're going to declare, Lord, that you have a blessing for your children. We're going to declare that this blessing will go on generation after generation. That it starts with us. We receive it in its fullness today. We glorify the name of Jesus. Amen.